change his life with one bold stroke. can't read this. What's this? Act natural. No, just please put $50,000 into this bag and act natural. It does say act natural. Uh, so I'm pointing uh, a gun at you. That looks like gub. That doesn't look like gun. No, that's gun. No, that's gub. Uh, that's a B. No, see, that's an N. It's, it's G-U-N. It's gun. Uh, George, would you step over here a moment, please? What does this say? Please put fifty thousand dollars into this bag and act natural. What's act? Act. act. Uh, does this uh, does this look like gub or gun? Gun. See. But what's app mean? It's act. A C T. Act natural. Please put fifty thousand dollars into this bag. Act natural. It's not... Oh, I see. Uh, this is a holdup. Yes. May I see your gun? You'll have to have this note initialed by one of our vice presidents before I can give you any money. See, see, I'm in a rush. What? I'm in a rush. I'm sorry, but that's our policy. The gentleman in the gray suit. That's G U N. I'm pointing. Yes, oh, that's I'm, a B. That's I'm pointing gub. a gun at you. Gun. That's that's G U N. Well, that's gun. a B. That's gub. <clears throat> no, excuse me. That's a, that's an N. I'm, I'm, I'm... Uh, Miss Frank. I am pointing a gun at you. Apt natural. No, that's what act. is apt? Yeah, that's act. Oh, it couldn't be. That's yes. a plain B. No, 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 no. I'm afraid not. That's that's act natural. Oh, I'm pointing a gun be. at you. Mr. No, Miller. Right. I am pointing a gub. No, that's gun. That's G U N. And that's gun. I am pointing a gun at it's you. G U B. No, no. It looks like a B, but, but it's an N. Right it says oh, no, that's gun. Of course it is. I see it's a gun. No, no, it isn't. That's, that's the point. Two of us now. It's a gun. It isn't a gun. I just couldn't come over here. Yes, we discussed this inside just a short while ago. We were there on the window, and it's gun. If I know what I mean, it's gun. Hello, Louise. Uh, listen, I can't make our date today. Yeah, I've got to go up to Boston to give a concert. Well, well, look, why don't I give you a call in about, um... About ten years. Good morning, Grace Point. Good to have you here with us this morning. Those of you who are here in person, so good to have you here with us. And for those of you who are joining us online, thank you for doing so. Trust that you'll be encouraged. If you are a first-time guest with us, either in person or online, I would really appreciate it if you might fill out that welcome card that you'll find in the back of the chair that is in front of you. Or if you're online, you can find the welcome card either at our YouTube site or also at our website, gracepointtoronto.ca. That just lets me know that you are here, and uh, that way we as a staff will pray for you this week. And if we can be of any assistance to you, please just jot that down, and we'll do whatever we can to, uh, to do that. It's so good to have you with us this morning. Well, the media piece that we just watched comes from the 1969 movie, Take the Money and Run, and it chronicles the life of, of Virgil Starkwell. And in the scene that we just watched together, Virgil attempts to rob a bank, but it all gets rather confusing and messed up because of misunderstanding of the note that he passes to the bank teller, the handwritten note, where there is confusion around a couple of words. Is that gub or gun? Is it apt or act? And you know, a lot of uh, comedy that we see in film and uh, on TV programs is based around the concept of misunderstanding. We have uh, probably all uh, experienced the reality of that in our viewing habits when something is used as the basis of comedy because it's based on a misunderstanding that someone has of something else. 
But of course, in real life, when it comes to our experience living out life, misunderstanding is often not a laughing matter. We've probably all had occasion of being misunderstood by someone else, either our words or our actions, and it's a rather unpleasant experience. This morning we're going to consider the biblical account of a really bad couple of days that stretch into a bad couple of weeks and months for the Apostle Paul, which was based on a misunderstanding that then turned into mistreatment by those who opposed his message of faith in Christ. If you've got a Bible, I invite you to take it and turn to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21 is going to be our text this morning as we resume our current Sunday morning series, walking through the book of Acts after uh, a one-week break last Sunday for Easter. Bringing to a close his third and final missionary journey, Paul has been making his way back to the holy city of Jerusalem. If you've been with us over the last number of weeks, you know that Paul has a call on his life to go to Jerusalem. The Spirit of God has called him to go back to Jerusalem. And yet the Spirit of God has also warned him that in doing so, he is going to experience persecution and pain. And yet, despite that reality, Paul sets his, uh, his uh, direction for Jerusalem, and he has been making his way back. For as Paul says at one point in that journey, that he was ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not long after entering the city of Jerusalem, once he does in fact arrive, the predictions of problems for Paul quickly begin to materialize. It seems to me this morning that uh, the text that we have before us unfolds in a number of scenes. And the first scene I've entitled Depreciation, because I think it captures what we see as our text this morning opens. It captures the welcome that Paul receives from those who were in leadership in the church in Jerusalem, when he first arrives in town. Beginning in Acts chapter 21, verse 17, we're told, When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry, and when they heard it, they glorified God. The day after arriving in Jerusalem, Paul and his companions, including Dr. Luke, who is writing the account we have here in Acts, have a meeting with James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the Jerusalem church uh, elders. So this was a big deal. Paul arrives in town. This is what he has been uh, focused on, getting back to Jerusalem. He is bringing with him an entourage, as you know. He has various Gentile believers with him, representing the churches that Paul has been used of the Lord to establish in his missionary journeys. And he has brought them along with him because they are bringing a financial gift to their brothers, their Jewish brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are going through tough times. And so Paul arrives in town, and the next day, he and his entourage have a meeting with James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, and also the elders. It would seem that at this point, the year being probably 56 or 57 A.D., all of the remaining apostles are no longer in Jerusalem. And the church there is being led by James and a team of church elders. That's why when Paul arrives in town, he doesn't meet with any of the other apostles. Remember, James is not an apostle. James is the half-brother of our Lord, but he's not an apostle. And yet James has risen over time, and we see that actually in Acts, to a position of prominence within the church in Jerusalem, which is now being led by a team of, of elders. Now, there could have been potential in this meeting for a a fair bit of tension. 
because uh, Paul and James have become really the representative leaders of two different expressions of the Christian faith, the one Jewish and the one Gentile. Uh, James leading the church in Jerusalem, which was predominantly a Jewish church, and Paul having established these Gentile churches and being very much the apostle to the Gentiles. So you could have had some tension with those uh, two uh, sizable personalities meeting together. But after Paul shares of God's grace towards the Gentiles through the course of his ministry, James and the elders respond with praise to God as an expression of gratitude for the Lord's working through Paul within the Gentile world. And there's really no reason to doubt the sincerity of their joyful response. They glorified God. When they hear how God has opened up an opportunity for Gentiles to become part of the covenant people, how God, through the ministry of Paul and others, had had taken the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the Gentile world, and how people were responding in faith, they glorified God. They were excited about that. They were thrilled. They were so happy. They praised God. For that work of his grace. However, despite their appreciation of God's good work through Paul, James and the leaders of the Jerusalem church then proceed to share certain apprehension they have about Paul's ministry. Have you ever had these meetings where, you know, everything's going great, everything is excited, everybody's on the same page, and then there's, now, now there's just one thing we'd like to discuss with you, Paul. And that's what happens here. So after Paul gives his report, and they all celebrate and they glorify God, I'm sure they prayed together and they worship God for his goodness. Then when that was over, probably James took the lead and said, now, now, now Brother Paul, there's just one matter that we want to discuss with you. This concern marks the second scene in our account this morning, which continues as follows, beginning in the second half of verse 20. And they said to him, that is to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They're all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So what's going on here? What is the issue that James and the elders raise with Paul on this occasion? The issue of concern wasn't about how one is saved. There was agreement between James and Paul and their respective colleagues that salvation is through faith in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, not by any works of the law. This was not about salvation. It wasn't about how a Jew or Gentile get restored to relationship with God. It wasn't about that. In fact, the decision on that matter made about eight to ten years earlier at the Jerusalem Council recorded back in Acts 15 is actually affirmed here by the leaders of the church in Jerusalem in verse 25 of our text. Gentiles don't have to become Jews in order to be saved. So the issue of concern wasn't about the way of salvation, and it had nothing to do about Gentile believers having to adopt Jewish customs and traditions. It wasn't about that. Rather, the concern was about the way of discipleship for those in Christ who are Jewish. For apparently there was a rumor going around that Paul was teaching that Jewish believers should stop observing the Jewish practices of the law of Moses. This was the issue. There was a rumor going around that as Paul was planting churches in the predominantly Gentile world of the Roman Empire, there were Jews as well who were responding to faith in Jesus Christ. And the rumor was that Paul was telling his fellow Jews 
who came to faith in Christ that they should stop their practice of the traditions connected to the Mosaic law. That they should no longer do those things. That it would be wrong for them as those in Christ to continue doing such. Paul was apparently, according to this rumor, teaching that to Jewish believers. And so, for example, they were no longer to celebrate Passover or the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, or participate in various prescribed temple purification rituals, or keep the Sabbath, or circumcise their male children, and the list goes on. This was the rumor that was going around the church in Jerusalem with regards to what Paul was teaching. This was the essence of the problem. And this is what was troubling many of the members of the church in Jerusalem. Now, these were believers. These are fellow Christians, people who have come to faith. Okay, We're talking about Jewish believers in the Jerusalem church. And many of them were troubled by what they were hearing, uh, apparently, that Paul was teaching. But it really is a misunderstanding of what Paul is teaching. It was based on a misunderstanding of really the message that Paul was bringing. You see, there was confusion between what Paul had been permitting versus what he had been commanding. While Paul taught that it was no longer required for Jewish believers to follow the practices of Jewish religious tradition and custom, he never prohibited such. Now, that's a big difference. Paul did teach that if you were a Jew who came to faith in Christ, you no longer had to keep the rituals and practices related to the Mosaic law. But he never said that you must not do so. He just said you didn't have to do it, but if you chose to do it, that was fine. In fact, Paul himself continued to practice as a Jew some of the traditions and practices that surrounded the Mosaic law. He himself did that. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. And so these were issues of freedom for Paul. It was the issue of when you come to faith in Christ, you are free in Christ. Christ has satisfied all of the requirements of the Mosaic law. You are now free. But in your freedom, you can also exercise those practices as a Jewish believer if you choose to. But you don't have to. For Paul, it was a matter of freedom And this whole issue was a misunderstanding of Paul's position. It was a misunderstanding to say that Paul was requiring Jews to stop acting like Jews once they became Christ followers. And this brings us to scene three in our text this morning, where Paul agrees to clarify his position through an affirmation of the Mosaic law. You see, the leaders of the Jerusalem church suggest something practical that Paul might do in order to clear up the rumors that were kind of rampant in the church there in Jerusalem concerning this misunderstanding. It seems that James and the elders who were leading the church did not think Paul was doing anything wrong. They understood this was a groundless rumor. And so they suggest a way that Paul can demonstrate in a very public manner to the believers in the Jerusalem church that what he is alleged to have been teaching, he was not teaching. Beginning in verse 23, they say to Paul, Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple. 
giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Apparently there were four guys there in the church in Jerusalem. These were believers. They were Jewish. They were part of the church there in Jerusalem. And they had taken what is known as a Nazarite vow. Now this seems kind of weird to us, doesn't it? Uh, we don't really understand what is this all about. When you first read the text, it looks like Paul is being asked to pay, pay for the haircut for four guys. Isn't that what it looks like? Hey, Paul, would you pony up some money so these four guys can get their hair cut? Uh, it's a little bit, little bit more than just that. A Nazarite vow was taken by individuals who had voluntarily dedicated themselves to God for a specific purpose for a specific period of time. All right? So it was something around their life that they were going to dedicate themselves for a specific purpose for a specific period of time. It wasn't, you know, lifelong. And uh, as part of engaging in that kind of vow, one of the things that you agreed to do is to refrain from cutting your hair. The termination of the vows made by these four guys mentioned here in our text would be accompanied by each of the four of them making various offerings at the temple, and it was proposed that Paul should pay the significant expenses associated with those offerings for all four of those guys. Part of what would happen is uh, there were various uh, animal offerings that would be made as sacrifices. There were some drink offerings, etc. And Paul was being asked to pay for the expenses of those offerings for these four guys. And at the end of the Nazarite vow, what would happen is that the priests would cut the hair of the person and then they would burn the hair. And it was actually called a hair offering. So the next time you go to the barber, say, I'm here for a hair offering. Um, and so that was part of it. That's part of the Nazarite vow. This was an accepted act of Jewish piety. And Paul's action would demonstrate that he was not against Jewish Christians observing the law of Moses. These four guys were Christians. And so if Paul pays for them, then obviously he's saying there's nothing wrong with Christians who are Jewish following this ritual practice. Now, Paul himself needed a ceremonial ritual cleansing before he could enter the temple because he had been in Gentile lands. And so if you were a Jew and you were coming back from Gentile land, then before you could go into the inner sanctum of the, the inner uh, courtyards of the, of the temple, you had to go through a purification process. And Paul himself was going to do that. And so he commits himself to doing that and at the same time paying for these four guys to, you know, uh, have their Nazarite vow brought to completion. And he agrees to the suggestion that is made by James and the leaders to do this. Now, there is debate about this. If, um, if there is a time in Paul's life when some say that he sinned, this is it. Uh, there are debates uh, among New Testament scholars around why Paul did this and was it right for Paul to do this. I think it was completely appreciate for Paul to do this, and I'll share that in a, uh, a reason why, why I believe that in a moment. But there is some debate about this from, uh, from people within the Christian community about what was done here. Um, but it seems to me that what Paul was doing here was he was agreeing to support this suggestion by James and the leaders of the Jerusalem church instead of asserting his personal freedom in Christ. In other words, for the sake of the gospel... Among the Jews, Paul takes a conciliatory approach and he willingly restrains the exercise of his freedom in Christ. Now, this is completely consistent with his own gospel principles. As, for example, he expresses them in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he writes, 
Even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Now, I want to just camp on this for a moment. This is a very significant principle for those of us who are in Christ and have freedom in Christ. Notice what Paul says. I try to find common ground with everyone. Now, let that principle rattle around in your head for a minute. I try to find common ground with everyone. That is a life principle that you and I need to take to heart. Because Paul understood what is most important in life. And that is that people come to know Christ. That people move from darkness to light. That people move from spiritual death to spiritual life. Paul was razor sharp on what his purpose was. And so as he sought to fulfill that purpose, he tried to find common ground with everyone. Paul understood that you're truly free in Christ when you're not enslaved to the exercise of your own freedom. Let me say that again. Paul understood that you're truly free in Christ when you're not enslaved to the exercise of your own freedom. And we who are free in Christ need to understand that. Instead of saying, I'm having bacon tonight on my burger no matter what anyone says, Paul was more focused on his ultimate goal of seeing people come to Christ and grow in their love and devotion to the Lord. He was therefore willing to accommodate their concerns when he was able to do so, even if that was not his personal preference. Why? Because it's not about your personal preference. It's about ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing people come to Christ. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean that you'll do anything. Of course not. I don't think I need to tell you that. I think I've been your pastor long enough. You know that's not the case. You are not in the pursuit of um, sharing the gospel to sin against God. You are not to use uh, a commitment to share the gospel as an excuse to act in an immoral, unethical manner. Of course not. We're not talking about that. But we have preferences, don't we? And we have freedom in Christ. But maturity when you are a Christian comes when you understand that it's not about you always exercising your freedom. Because when you live the Christian life like that, it's about you. And the Christian life is about Christ. And it's about serving Christ and serving others. And so, at times, when you are seeking to be a witness of Christ, when you are seeking to build a bridge to people who don't know Christ, when you are seeking to encourage people who know Christ, who have certain qualms about certain things, what do you do out of love for God, out of love for them? You hold back on the exercise of your freedom. But that's a choice that you make in your freedom. You understand? 
You are exercising your choice because of your love for Christ and your love for others. And that's what Paul does here. In other words, Paul doesn't flaunt his Christian freedom. And that is an important principle of Christian living that each of us in Christ need to take to heart. And when does this come into the realm of our lives? We need to take this to heart when it comes to the choices that we make, the political opinions that we express, the social media that we post. What is your life about as a Christ follower? Is it about a political party? Is it about a philosophy of economics? Is it about winning every argument? Is it about correcting every wrong? What is your life about? And if you and I as Christians begin to get off of the center, which is we have been called to serve God, and at the core of our calling is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there is nothing more important than being a witness of that gospel so that others might come to know Christ, then we are going in the wrong direction. Maybe thinking for all the right reasons. So, my friends, this is something we need to think about. A concern for the spread of the gospel, preserving the unity of the church, and bringing glory to God need to be determining factors in our living out with wisdom and discernment our Christian lives. And that begins with me, and it extends to each one of you who are in Christ. And it's a hard thing today because we have so much opportunity today to display our ignorance. So let's think about this and the example of Paul here as he chooses what is best in making this commitment to the leaders here in the Jerusalem church. So if Paul makes the right decision here, one might think that everything would turn out great, that it would result in a they lived happily ever after ending. But guess what? That's not the way life is, is it? When you do the right thing, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody stands up and applauds. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to say, hey, you're right, that's great, count me in. In reality, things actually got worse rather than better as misunderstanding was followed by mistreatment. In the fourth scene in our text this morning, Paul becomes the target of a series of unwarranted accusations. Beginning in verse 27, we read, At the end of those seven days, some Jews from Asia region saw Paul in the temple. They said some bad things against Paul to the crowd. So the people became angry, and they took hold of Paul. The Jews from Asia shouted, People of Israel, come and help us. This is the man who goes everywhere, and he teaches everyone bad things. Now, listen to this. He speaks against us, the people of Israel. He also speaks against the law of Moses and against this temple. Now he has even brought some Gentiles into this temple. So now this special place is not clean in front of God any longer. These men had earlier seen Paul in the city with a man called Trophimus. Trophimus was a Gentile who came from Ephesus. They thought that Paul had brought Trophimus into the temple. And that is why they shouted bad things against Paul. Near the conclusion of the seven-day purification ritual, Paul finds himself in the temple, and he's recognized by some Jews, unbelievers, who were in town to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. At the time that Paul is there in town, this is the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, and there is a large group of pilgrims in Jerusalem, and apparently these are some of those who Paul encounters. In fact, they were from the Roman province of Asia, and they were probably from the city of Ephesus, where Paul had pastored for some three years. 
viewing this as an opportunity to get rid of this preacher of the gospel, their nemesis Paul, these Jews provoked the worship crowd into a frenzy with a series of trumped-up charges. Now, what are the charges? First, they accused Paul of being anti-Semitic, an enemy, in other words, of the Jewish people. How absolutely ridiculous. Paul loved his fellow Jews. In fact, you know, Paul at one point says he'd be willing to give up his own salvation and be damned to eternity in hell if his fellow Jews would come to Christ. What was Paul's practice when he traveled? When he went into a town, into a city, where did he first go and share the message of the gospel? Always to the synagogue. To the Jews first. Why? Because he loved the Jewish people. The idea that he was against his own people is ridiculous. Second, they accused Paul of being opposed to the written law of Moses. That's certainly not the case. In Romans chapter 7, verse 12, Paul states that, quote, the law, he's talking about the law of Moses, is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Third, Paul is accused of speaking against the temple. And yet, Paul was there in the temple when the mob grabbed him. And why was he there? He was there in order to fulfill a purification ritual that was associated with the temple. Why would he bother to do that if he held the temple and the practices associated with it in disrepute? That makes no sense. And fourth, Paul was accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple area and thereby defiling the temple because they had seen him earlier in town with Trophimus, a Gentile, and they jumped to the conclusion that Paul had also brought Trophimus into the temple's inner court, which was off limits to the Gentiles. There was space in the temple compound for Gentiles, but they're talking about an inner court area where Gentiles were not permitted. How absolutely ironic The reality is that Paul is there in the temple that day undergoing personal purification. Why? So that he would not ceremonially defile the temple. Have you ever had those things happen in your life? When even though you're doing the right thing, you're getting called out and you're getting accused, and you're saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm doing the very thing you're accused like, of not doing. I care about the very thing you say I don't care about. The scene quickly shifts, beginning in verse 30, to attack. The combination of accusations was enough to bring people running from all directions. We're told, beginning in verse 30, many other people in the city heard about the trouble, and they also became angry. They all ran from their homes to the temple, and they took hold of Paul. Then they pulled him out of the temple, and they closed the doors immediately. The angry crowd was trying to kill Paul. But someone sent a message to the leader of the Roman soldiers. The message was, people are fighting everywhere in the city. So the soldier's leader quickly took some other officers and a large group of soldiers. They ran down to the crowd. The angry crowd of people saw the leader with his soldiers, so they then stopped hitting Paul. So the agitated mob that day seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple's inner court. They began savagely beating him. Like a frenzied pack of hyenas on their prey, they began tearing into the apostle, intent to beat him to death. They would have succeeded had not God providentially intervened, sending help in the form of of possibly up to 200 Roman soldiers from the garrison adjoining the temple compound where the soldiers were always alert and watching for uprisings in the city. At that time, there was a garrison that was actually built right adjacent to the temple compound. And it was high enough that they could look over the wall of the temple and they could see what was going on in the courtyard. And soldiers were always posted there because often there was issues of, you know, 
squabbling and, and uh, disputes taking place in the temple compound. And of course, the Romans were against any such things happening within the Roman Empire. And so here you have a situation where there's a big uprising and there's something happening and all these people are beating on Paul. Word gets back to the garrison leader. The garrison leader comes down. By the way, the garrison had steps right into the courtyard of the temple that would lead straight into the courtyard of the temple. They come down with their soldiers, move over to where Paul is being pummeled, and they rescue him. That significant show of force breaks up the riot. It saves Paul's life. When the mob saw the Roman leader, the military commander, and the soldiers with them, they stop assaulting Paul because they don't want to be arrested themselves. In fact, arrest is the final scene in our text this morning. When the commander couldn't determine who Paul was and what he had done because of the chaos and the mayhem that was going on, what happens is he has Paul arrested and he has him carried back into the garrison. Beginning in verse 33, we're told, the Roman soldier's leader went to Paul. He took hold of him. He said to his men, tie two chains round the arms of this man. Then he asked the people in the crowd, who is this man and what has he done? Some people in the crowd shouted one thing. Other people shouted something different. There was so much noise that the leader of the soldiers was not sure about the true facts. He did not know what had really happened. And so he said to his soldiers, take this man up into our strong building. That is the garrison. The soldiers then led Paul as far as the steps of their building. Then they had to carry him because the crowd was so angry crowd followed behind Paul and the soldiers, and they were shouting, kill him, kill him. Does that sound familiar? What a scene. Here's Paul being pummeled, surely to have been killed, and yet God in his providence rescues him through the Roman garrison leader and his soldiers, and they take him, and at the end, they got to get him through the crowd, and what do they do? They put him up on their shoulders like, you know, the victorious football coach, and they take him through the crowd into the garrison, and next week, we'll see before he goes into the garrison, Paul has a few things he wants to say, but we'll leave that for next week. We've seen this morning Paul's from Paul's life, misunderstanding can lead to mistreatment. And some of you may know the reality of that in a very personal way and in a very painful way. In fact, perhaps if truth be known, that's where you find yourself in these days. If so, I think there's a point of encouragement that we can take from Paul's experience. As Paul sat in a Jerusalem prison, surely wondering what was happening. He didn't really know what God was up to. Because you see, everything that was happening, God was ultimately fulfilling his purpose. And when you're in the midst of it at times, you can't see that. All you see is the bad day, the bad week, the bad month. That's all you see. But God was working. Paul's heart had been set on not only going to Jerusalem, but also going to Rome to preach the gospel there in the imperial city, very much at that time center of the known world. Well, Paul didn't know it, but God was working things out for Paul to receive a free, all-expenses-paid trip to Rome, compliments of the Roman Empire. Paul didn't understand it. Paul thought that he was going to travel after going to Jerusalem. He was going to travel to Rome, just like he had always done. But what he didn't know is that God was going to provide the means for him to get to Rome. And it was going to be on the tab of the emperor himself. He wasn't going to go there, though, as a preacher. He was going to arrive in town as a prisoner. Now, that may sound terrible to us. You may say, well, that's horrible. I mean, he, he ends up going as a prisoner. 
But that was God's grand plan. Why was that? Well, over in Philippians chapter 1, Paul now on the other side, Paul now with the perspective of now seeing what God had done, Paul writes in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to what? Advance the gospel. What did I say a few moments ago was the focus of Paul's life and should be the focus of our life? as those in Christ, to advance the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial garb and to all the rest that my imprisonment here in Rome, he's talking about, is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul likely wrote these words to the Christ followers in Philippi while he was under house arrest in Rome, chained to alternating members of Caesar's own imperial guard. From the inside position that gave him, Paul faithfully witnessed about Christ. Can you imagine those poor imperial guards chained to Paul for, you know, their shift? And Paul saying, hey, how are you? Let me tell you about Jesus. And then sharing about Jesus with them. And then the next guy comes in. Hey, good to see you. Let me tell you about Jesus. And this is what Paul did. He got to know them. He got to care. I'm sure he prayed for them. Asked them about their families. Asked them about what was going on in their lives. Shared with them about the hope of Christ. He's an inside, he's inside now at the, at the level of uh, the emperor's own imperial guard. And what's happening is the gospel is going out. And the imperial guard is hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And pretty soon, the message of the gospel is known throughout that special regiment. And you've got to believe that by God's grace, some of them came to faith in Christ. Not only that, but the people who were part of the church there in Rome, they were emboldened by Paul's example. And they were sharing the gospel more boldly with those within their spheres of influence, because under house arrest, they could come and visit Paul. And what would Paul be telling them? Be telling them about what God is doing. Don't be disheartened. Look what God is doing. Consequently, the influence of the gospel in the heart of pagan Rome grew, and it all began with one really bad couple of days in Paul's life, when he was arrested at the temple in Jerusalem, having been misunderstood and mistreated. Is it any wonder then, my friends, that Paul writes over in Romans chapter 8, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? That you be happy? What is his purpose? That every, uh, every one of your whims be met? What is his purpose? That, you know, you have a comfortable life? No. His purpose is that the gospel go forth. His purpose is that we glorify God. That God is exalted. That God is praised. That the gospel moves forward, that we try to find common ground with everyone we can for the purpose of the gospel. And this is what Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. In his case, misunderstanding led to mistreatment, yes, but ultimately it led to the fulfillment of mission. And we, as those in Christ, are a people with a purpose. Let us not forget what that purpose is. 
Let's try and remember this the next time we have a really bad day or a bad week or a bad month and find ourselves misunderstood and mistreated. Perhaps God has something bigger and better in mind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather together today to celebrate your goodness, your greatness, to respond to who you are in worship, in song, that we have united our hearts together in prayer, and in doing so, we have expressed our dependency upon you, and we have had opportunity to turn our thoughts to your word. And Lord, as we've thought about the issue of misunderstanding and mistreatment today through the life of Paul, I pray that you have encouraged us, that Lord, that as we live our lives here in 2023 in Toronto, that, Lord, that we would keep in mind what our purpose is and that we, we would keep focused on what that purpose is and we would not allow ourselves to get distracted, which we so easily do, by the things that the world wants to pull us into. Lord, help us to think about how we can find common ground with people that we meet people we work with, people that are part of our family, people that know you and people who do not know you. Common ground for the purpose of the gospel, that you might use us to bring glory to your name. And Lord, in the midst of the, of the darkness and the pain of being misunderstood, I pray that you might encourage us with the big picture that even as you worked through those dark days in Paul's life to ultimately bring people to Christ and to glorify your name, that you want to do the same in the midst of the dark days we're experiencing as well. That through those experiences, that Lord, by your grace, that you would be glorified, that you would be honored, that your name would be exalted. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it has been great to have you here with us today. What a beautiful day we have outside. I love this time of year. Spring is my favorite time of year. And so we have a beautiful day to enjoy. Thank you for making uh, this part of your day today. I trust the Lord will bless you. Just as uh, a couple of reminders, as you're leaving, we have offering baskets at the back. If you have brought offering you'd like to uh, give that, you can do it through that way. Also, we invite you to join us over in the gym. We have refreshments. Great time to connect with one another. Lord bless you.